Welcome, listeners and your demons, to another episode of the Phantology Podcast. Today we're going to be reviewing The Golden Compass, the first book of His Dark Materials, by Philip Pullman. And before we get too far, let me just briefly mention, if you like our content and want to chat with us more, check out our Discord server. And also you can find us on social media at Phantology Books. Today, Josh is on the line with me. What's up, Josh? Not much, Steven. I'm excited to talk about this series. It's pretty it's pretty great, and it's going to spark a lot of good discussions. Yeah, and you just recently read, you, you read all three of these books, right? I understand there's more than three, but the main trilogy that was published back in the late 90s is the His Dark Materials, right? Yep, I finished reading these, and from what I understand is there's going to be a continuation of this series in the works from, from the author, from Phil Pullman. Yeah, so it sounds like there are a couple other books, a couple of novellas, and he's also working on a sequel series, right? Yep. So I have not read any um, of the books outside of the main trilogy, but that's something I'm interested in. And if our listeners want, then I'm happy to read those and we can do reviews for those as well. Yeah, so I just finished reading The Golden Compass, book one, which is titled, original titled The Northern Lights. And then there was some confusion with the series title and the book title. But Golden Compass is what North American readers know the book as. And actually, a little, little fun fact here, backstory on this. I got this book. I received this book when I was much younger. I think it was like a grandparent's birthday present, and they, they gave me the book. And back in those days, they used to put dollar bills inside the pages to, uh, you know, to invite reading. And as you read through more pages, you got more dollars. So, of course, I just opened it and flipped it upside down and got all the dollars out. And <laughs> I never actually read the book. Stephen, you missed out on a, a really good, in my opinion, book. It would have been great to read as a kid, even better. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't read. I mean, I read quite a bit as a kid, so this must not have caught my interest. Yeah, I feel like whenever an adult tells you to read a book, it automatically just makes you less interested in reading it as a kid. Like, I was always interested in reading the books that I wanted to read, not really ones that, like, adults would give me. Yeah, and to bring this full circle, Gold, The Golden Compass is about a kid protagonist, right? It's somewhat of a YA book, although that's a little controversial. So Lyra is our main character. She's like a 10-ish year old girl. And one of the big themes and one of my favorite parts of the book is just how obstinate she is and how she doesn't obey anything adults tell her and uh, and just gets away with everything. Yeah, I mean, she's she's an awesome character and we'll get into that more. But it seems like she always does her own thing and her own thing is the right thing so she's a pretty fun character to read and follow yeah and i had some questions for you and maybe you know the answers to to these better but we can get into this in our spoiler section because it just seems like lyra is too perfect in that she's always she's she's almost too smart she can read the alethiometer for some reason and everything she does just kind of works out for her and I, i like that to some degree but on a on another level It seems a little suspicious. Like, I feel like there may be more going on with her, but I don't know yet. So uh, so maybe we can talk about that more as we get into the review. Yeah, let's wait till we get into the review for that. A little a little bit another uh, little little known factor. I guess not that little known, but the the title of the Golden Compass actually comes from from Paradise Lost from a line in Paradise Lost. And it refers to the actual like instrument, um, like drawing instrument of a compass. And the publishers thought it referred to the lithiometer in America. And so that's where, that's why there's like the golden compass on the title, but that's not what the original uh, meaning was when, when Phil Pullman put that out. Yeah. Also what I thought until I read the Wikipedia page to prepare for this podcast, I'm assuming that you did this as well. Uh, No, actually I, I read an article about like 12 little known things about golden compass, about the golden compass. Okay. You're a real fan. I'm a real fan. No, I, I, uh, it was interesting because I was, I was interested in how it was received and the way that was published, whether it was like published as a YA book or, you know, had how you kind of mentioned that there's some controversy surrounding that. Yeah. So before we go too far and let's just kind of talk about the book in broad strokes, I mentioned it's somewhat of a YA book. We have a young girl protagonist and she is going on an adventure. It is set in a alternate earth alternate universe type setting so and it's almost like a steampunk setting 
which is surprising how much I liked the book because historically I do not really like steampunk setting books. Yeah, it, it has the steampunk setting, but not really a steampunk tone, if that makes sense. Like it's not really in your face about the setting the way that some steampunk books are. Yeah, the setting is very cool, but it's very much in the background. You can look up maps of the His Dark Materials world and kind of see what Philip Pullman is going for. And it's really cool how all of the nations are different and the earth looks a little bit different. And it talks about this a little bit in terms of just like how many universes there are. It's a a bit of a multiverse thing that's going on here. Not to get too heavy into spoilers, but you're going to be exposed to more of that in the later books. Right. From what I understand, the first book is a fun adventure with Lyra and it's hinting at a lot of larger plot elements. But then the second and third is where you really kind of the curtain is pulled back and the real action begins. Is that accurate? Yeah, for sure. It gets into a much larger conflict and it spans multiple worlds, I guess you could say. And it, it gets really interesting the second and third. The the story gets a little bit less. You're just following Lyra down a straight path that you kind of know where it's going. And it, it expands out a little bit. You still follow, follow Lyra, but you get a lot more of the world is opened up to you. And does it also get more philosophical in the later books? It does, but I'd say that I don't know about more philosophical. I feel like the first one was pretty philosophical as well. The heavy philosophy themes definitely permeate the whole series. Yeah, and I think I think we would be remiss to mention there is some controversy around the book. There are there, there's a significant pushback from hardcore Christians that the book is atheist. It's even gone as far to be have been described as like the anti chronicles of Narnia. So you can read it through that lens and see some of that criticism. I kind of read it as just an alternate take on religion and the history of the world and Christianity. I don't think you have to say that it's, it's atheist, although Philip Pullman himself is an atheist. Yeah. So, okay. What do you think if you, I mean, we both come from uh, religious households. First of all, do you think that your parents would have let you read this as a 10 year old? Well, my grandparents gave it to me for my birthday, probably when I was about 10. So so that's probably a yes. I, I, my parents would have. But I think, I think I know people that they probably wouldn't have been um, if their parents knew everything that all the themes that this book talked about. I probably know people that wouldn't have been allowed to read it. Well, come on. I also knew people who weren't allowed to read Harry Potter because it was evil with witchcraft. Well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think that there is a little bit more to... There are some anti-established religion themes that are in this book that are much more prevalent than like the themes in Harry Potter are. Yeah. And I'm assuming that gets more and more as you go into the the next books in terms of just how, uh, how, how defined it is. Because in the first book, I picked on that, picked up on that just in as much as the church is now called what the theocracy and they're very influenced into the government and they are trying to suppress the research into this mysterious phenomenon going on that they call dust and it's this is the mystery of the first book still not resolved super well some of the adult characters are trying to discover more but being thwarted by the church and the church is you know painted in in a bad light they're kind of inept and also just trying to suppress knowledge they're the villains of the the antagonists of the story at times So to to answer my own question, because I I don't really want to leave it that ambiguous, I think that it is important that kids, if they're interested, like do read the story. I think that there are a lot of really interesting themes and a lot of interesting questions that kids can learn and grow from. Um, Even in a religious household, I think that that should be something that the parents would read along with the kids and read it together and talk about it and talk about what aligns and does not align with their beliefs. But it's, I think it handles the themes it addresses really well. Yeah, and I think that probably covers us for a content warning for this book. There's no real content. It's a, it's a YA book in that sense, and that there's no language, sexual content, or real violence. I mean, there's some fighting, but it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty tame, right? I'm not forgetting anything. No, I would say PG violence. The, I mean, the, well, the ending of the first book, and I don't want to get into spoilers, but there's... Um, this book doesn't shy away from from death and from the effects of death, I'd say. Yeah, I w- so there are definitely some actions and themes that are much more serious and you may want to to consider with kids reading the book, but the actual description of what's going on is very tame. 
I in the third book, another kind of interesting tidbit is the American version had a few lines uh, censored out of the third book because it talks a little bit about Lyra's like sexual awakening, but nothing explicit at all. So I, I was surprised because I went and read them and thought it was going to be like whoa, but no, it was like it was really still tame. And this book won a bunch of awards in the late '90s, right? This is one of the foundational. One of the foundational books for fantasy and YA fantasy, especially, right? Yeah. And I'm surprised that I got through my uh, childhood without really being too aware of these books, because I think it would have been right up my alley, too, as a kid. But yeah, these for sure, pretty foundational. And they're good enough where you and I both recently read them, and we are in our 20-somethings, and we both really enjoyed them, right? Even though they're written for a YA audience? Yeah. Well, and again... Phil Pullman has said that he didn't really write them as YA books, but that's just kind of how they've been marketed by the publishers. And so I think you can read them at any age and learn a lot and enjoy the read and the story. Yeah, YA, the definition of YA is always a little murky for me. I can't define it super well. Let's talk about, let's let's go into the book. So I'm going to read the blurb on Goodreads, and then we can uh, we can discuss some spoilers and talk about the details of what's going on here. So Lyra, our heroine, is rushing to the cold far north where witch clans and armored bears rule. North where the gobblers take the children they steal, including her friend Roger. North where her fearsome uncle Israel is trying to build a bridge to a parallel world. Can one small girl make a difference in such great and terrible endeavors? This is Lyra, a savage, a schemer, a liar, and as fierce and true a champion as Roger or Israel could want. But what Lyra doesn't know is that to help one of them will be to will be to betray the other okay yeah so what how do you think that description does it setting up the book yeah it kind of puts us right into the action the the book moves along pretty quickly and i think maybe that's one thing that would put it more in the in the ya camp in that uh, there's never too much time for slower moments of internal dialogue where you really get deep things going on with the characters that you might see in more adult fantasy so it's why in the sense of you're following Lyra and she's this really fun, bratty uh, young kid who's just perfectly obstinate in every way, but she's characterized through her actions, not internal and, and not an internal dialogue. And that really makes things go quickly. And I think you see that in, in this review, in this little blurb as well. I really enjoyed the Jordan College setting and I was kind of disappointed that they didn't get to spend more time. I thought that that was established really well. It's kind of like how Winterfell is established in Game of Thrones of just being like a really safe place for Lyra where she kind of knows everything and knows all the politics of all the kids. And then we kind of get pulled out from that from that setting. And that was kind of disappointing to me. Yeah, I think you and I both really love fantasy school settings. And anytime that they leave the fantasy school, even though fantasy school has been done so many times, I feel like authors don't want to just do it. It's always a little disappointing when they leave the school because school is so fun, right? Well, exactly. I think. I mean, I do think that we both enjoyed school and and made a lot of good friends there. So, I, I enjoy those settings. But she kind of got kicked into action when her friend got kidnapped by the gobblers. Yeah, our boy Roger, who really just kind of serves as the impetus to to get the plot moving. I, I thought he he didn't have a whole lot of characterization other than he's Lyra's friend and Lyra wants to save him. Yeah, which, again, this is kind of a trope that is getting turned upside down in terms of like gender roles. I feel like a lot of times in fantasy, it's, you know, the the boy that gets goes after to rescue his his girlfriend or the damsel in distress. And so I do enjoy that Roger's kind of just a hapless, innocent boy that um, Lyra is going to such great lengths to to rescue. Yeah, and I want to go back to the setting a little bit. We talked about how cool the steampunk setting was. And the alternate Earth setting was, I also thought the way that the demons interacted with the human personalities was very interesting. So reminder, every person has a a demon, which is essentially just like an extension of their consciousness. And when you're a child, it can change forms between whatever animal, I guess, best suits the occasion. And then when, when, uh, when kids mature, then the demon takes on a... A, a permanent form and this then is related to the phenomenon of the dust which is not explained in this book and i don't quite understand enough to really talk about yet so no spoilers there josh 
But we know that as as kids mature and as their demon takes on a, a form that is interacting with these elementary particles that Israel is trying to hunt down. I won't spoil these things, although these are some things, I guess this is kind of a spoiler in a sense, but he doesn't give super definitive answers for things like why the demons settle, you know, on when they, uh, when kids kind of go through puberty or he, he leaves those open to interpretation. And I think that there are some interpretations that are correct, but what, what do you think? What, as you read the first book, what, what was going through your mind when you read about things like that? I liked the demons and I also was a little disappointed by them. I liked that they were just an extension of the kid's personality or, you know, the, the individual's personality. And I thought it was cool that they were basically pets. And I thought it would be fun to have one myself. <laughs> but I also thought that I was I was a little disappointed after reading Stormlight Archive, where you have Spren, who are kind of similar. Uh, like you, you see Syl following Kaladin around to avoid any spoilers for Stormlight Archive. But the Spren and Stormlight Archive have distinct personalities. They're not just an extension of the, the person. So then you see conflict between the two. And you never actually see any conflict between Lyra and her demon because they're really just the same person. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you get that there's a relationship there that is really important to both of them, right? That they that they need in order to feel complete. They need that relationship between the demon and the person. Yeah. Like if they get too far apart, they have this incredible sense of pain that they and they must um, get back to each other at, at all costs which then ties into the horror of what you see Mrs. Coulter and the gobblers doing in separating kids from their demons. And these kids that have, don't have their demons anymore are just lost and, and die. And before we even see them separate, we also see that Miss um, Coulter is able to go without, I'm forgetting her demon's name, but the, the golden monkey demon. Yeah, the evil golden monkey. Man, that golden monkey, that's the real villain in the story. Yeah. I want to watch the TV show and I hope they do a really good job of making the golden monkey seem really nefarious. Let's talk about the adaptions kind of at the end um, as a little end cap, but they do a really good job with that. But you also see that they're able to get more distance between themselves than most people and demons are. Mm. I thought that that was interesting. It, It kind of gave, I mean, okay, here's another thing that this book did an amazing job with. It did an amazing job with foreshadowing how bad of a person Miss Coulter was without her actually doing anything bad, right? for the first part of the book. Right. You certainly see the gobblers stealing kids and separating separating themselves or separating the demons from the kids. But Mrs. Coulter is always pristine and beautiful. And Lyra is just completely besotted with her and would follow her to the ends of the earth. But she's really the nice face on the evil venture that's going on here. Yeah, I thought it was super well done that kind of evil lurking behind this veneer of of grace and beauty and Lyra fell for it. So, I mean, we talked about how Lyra, Lyra was always right and always capable, but she was able to be deceived by Miss Coulter. Yeah, she's always, she's a bit of a dumb kid a lot yeah. of times, but she's always able, she just outsmarts the adults with to such ease, I thought, at, at a few times. Like there was a part towards the end where she is in, the prison up at no- up in the north, and this is somewhat of the climax as they as she gets all the kids out and she sets everything on fire, and it's like this really this ten year old girl is outsmarting all of the adults here, and I don't know it it just that made it seem YA to me because in a YA book you have the young hero that is able to overcome the the evil and incompetent adults. That's somewhat of a YA trope. Yeah, it, you definitely see comparisons to harry potter where harry's just like sneaking around in the castle and like outsmarting you know outsmarting all the professors and stuff same with other ya books where the kids just able to do whatever they want yeah so i would i would agree that that does kind of put it back into the ya camp when kind of the themes take it to where anyone can enjoy it and i'm interested in lyra i'm interested to see what happens in the next two books i just finished reading the witcher and siri is kind of a similar character in The Witcher, because she's a young girl that's had all these prophecies made about her, and she is super important for some reason. They always call her a child of destiny. And honestly, that was repeated so much that it just kind of wore on me. So when I started reading this book, I was a little taken aback because I was kind of tired of this theme. So yeah, what do you think about Lyra being, in a sense, kind of prophesied to be the chosen one? What 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 was your reading on all that? 
Yeah, a little uncertain now that I've got to the end because it seemed like there was something important about her in the middle and you get who her parents are. And now that we're saying spoilers, you know, we know that Lord Israel and Mrs. Coulter are her parents and they are very, they're probably the two most important people in the world right now. So there's, we know something's going on with Lyra. But then at the end, she doesn't really do anything especially memorable. In fact, at the very end, when she shows up, Lord Israel is very concerned because the whole time he was just trying to get a kid there so he could separate the demon from the kid and then power his interdimensional portal. That's at least my understanding to this, thus far. And so when he sees Lyra there, he's distraught because he thinks, oh man, I'm going to have to kill Lyra. I'm going to have to kill my daughter. This is something where the HBO adaption did so well. That scene of Lyra arriving up and James McAvoy seeing her. And up till this point, you don't really know that Lord Azrael is like a bad guy. And then you see this look of of concern, but also like of knowing that he's capable of doing whatever it takes to get to his goals. And I was watching with my wife and she's never read the books before or knows she doesn't know the story at all. And she was very concerned for Lyra at that point and what that, what was going to happen to Lyra. So he's got this look of like dedicated, concerned evil almost. Yeah. And over almost like horror at himself and what he's capable of doing. Like, knowing that he would make that decision, you know? Nice. Yeah, a huge moment in the book. So I'm glad to hear that they had such a phenomenal actor to portray it in the, in the show. Yeah, McAvoy does a really, really good job in that adaption. And I guess we should also mention, this is the big twist at the very end, where you never really know what's going on with Lord Azrael. And as I was reading it, up until the end, I did not think that he was really a bad guy. I thought he was more of a great character who was trying to accomplish some unknown means and would go to extreme lengths to do it. But I didn't think he was capable of killing a child. So he really just kind of showed his true colors at the end. And it was surprising and a little horrifying, a really good twist for me. Yeah. And that's what this book does a really good job of. It never completely paints people out to be antagonists until it does, I, I guess, if that makes any sense. You know that they have their own motives, but you and you know that those motives might not be lining up with Lyra's because Lyra is just trying to find Roger, right? And so you know that people have their own motives and are going to be using her for her their own things, but you never really know if those are good or bad motives until that end when you realize that he's trying to just sever a child from their demon. Speaking of Lord Israel, I was going to ask you, and I guess we're getting to the, ad, the show adaptation a little bit early, but he's not in the book a whole lot. He's in the book at the beginning, and then there is a flashback scene with them that I could see them making into the show. And then at the end, he pops up for the the final climax. But with James McAvoy in the show, I'm assuming he's got to be in every episode, right? So they must add him in? No, no. It follows. The adaption follows the show pretty well when it comes to his character, at least. Or it follows the book pretty well. He's definitely not in every episode, no. So, But they're able to make eight hour-long episodes out of this book, because the book's not that long. Oh yeah. Well, let's, let's talk, let's leave a little bit until let's talk about a little bit more of the pacing and stuff of the book. And then we'll get that lead us nicely into the adaption. Sure. Yeah. So as far as the pacing goes, I thought it was pretty well paced. I was always pretty involved and there was always kind of the next thing happening. It was a lot of the try fail cycle that you see, that you see in books where uh, you, you go along, characters are trying to reach a goal, they get there. And then, but this other thing happens, then we have to do this. And then this other thing happens. And so it it really drove the plot along pretty well. It was interesting because I always thought that the climax of the book was going to be when she gets to the north and and frees Roger. And that was kind of climactic, right? When she gets there and she distracts all the guards and then all the people come in, there's that battle. And I thought even while reading it, that that was going to be the climax of the book, even though I knew that there was still a large portion of the book left. I thought that was going to be the climax, but it really wasn't. Yeah, the final climax being this chase down of Lord Ezreal and Miss Coulter. One question I had with these two villains, how are they so good at convincing people to do things? Like Lord Ezreal is in prison, but he's got his own compound with everything he needs. And he's convinced the uh, the armored bears to give him all this stuff. And anytime Mrs. Coulter is in the scene, she's always had people are just bending over backwards to do her will. So maybe this is explained more, but it seems like there's like some kind of magical personality they have going on. Yeah, I don't think it's really explained much more than that. It's just I think that they are very powerful people up in the 
the government and in the church and they just have a lot of a lot of pull um you do see in the very first scenes of the book when lord israel comes down and is trying to convince the scholars at jordan college to like fund his research he like actually has to do some convincing you know and he ends up he does end up convincing them but yeah i mean anytime they're in a difficult situation their auras just overcome the people around them and I don't know. I, I guess I'm a little disappointed to hear you say there's nothing extra special going on there because that was one of the little notes that I, I jotted down in the back of my mind thinking there's there's something going on here. I got to watch for this. Well, I don't want to say, I, I, I mean, nothing in terms of like a magical, I, there's not a lot of magic in this book outside of the the setting and the, well, I shouldn't say that. There's not a, a magic system really in this book where people are like exercising the use of magic. For example, Harry Potter, there's a magic system. Well, there are the uh, there are the witches that are flying around and what they're shooting, they have bows and arrows, right? So I guess that's not magic. <laughs> there are definitely fantastical elements in the series, and you dive even more into those in the later books. But in the sense of like people that are uh, endowed with the gift of magic, not really. I mean, you get like Lyra being able to use the lithiometer. That's kind of magic, right? But not really somebody using this magic system that we're exposed to. And that was another note that I had down. Lyra is able to use this alethiometer so well. They talk about needing a book of symbols to interpret it, but she can just do it intuitively. So that makes me think there's something going on with her, but I don't know what it is yet. Yeah, I, I think keep keep reading. And I think a lot of the answers that you're looking for, you'll get, but they're they're more philosophically based answers than like, oh, here's like these plot points coming together that reveal this answer to you. And speaking of the philosophy, one of the main things that's going on here in the book is there's kind of the main story and there's the surface level that you can read it at a fun adventure with the girl going on an adventure and trying to stop unknown evil forces. And then underlying all of that, there's a deeper meaning to a lot of these things. And I think I would need to look into it more to really understand all of the symbols and, and things that are going on. But I, I did read it enough to know that I'm going to be watching for this more in the next two books. So a little bit of my reading history with this book is I tried to read it through a, philo- a philosophical lens and I didn't get very far. And then I try a few years later, I tried reading it and I was just like, okay, I'm going to enjoy the story. And then when I just focused on enjoying the story, I was able to appreciate a lot more of the philosophical things in it. And so I definitely think that you can go as deep as you want with these books. But first and foremost, I'd say enjoy the story and then just appreciate the undertones as they come along. And I think that's a hallmark of a really good book when they have layers, when you have an onion-like book or an ogre-like book (laughs) with multiple layers that you can really dive into. So what are some things that stood out to you here? in a philosophical lens. Okay. So I think that the biggest philosophical thing to me was you get the sense that, and sorry, I hope that this isn't like a spoiler, but like that dust and demons both kind of represent, represent sin and people growing into being able to sin, right? Like, and especially like the onset of puberty is when people's demons start changing, stop changing. And so when you sever the the demon from the child, it's in a sense like preventing them from being able to sin and they become just completely void of any meaning. And so on one level, if you're like this super, super devout Orthodox Christian, you would re- you could read that as saying, oh, well, that's saying that that sin is good, right? Like, and that we need sin. But I think what the deeper philosophy behind it is, is that you can't learn and grow and become better without making mistakes and without without sin. You know, and so I think that that really was a theme that I really enjoyed about it and that as we were watching the show my wife and I talked a lot about. So obviously some huge religious implications there. And if you think about what Lord Israel is trying to do at the end, he says he wants to what get to the source of all of it and get rid of the dust. And so I mean what religious character is he, right? Right. You can you can say that he represents like the devil in a lot of ways, right? Like he's going to just take away any choice that we have, right? Yeah. And I'm assuming we'll see more of, of how this plays out in the next two books. I don't think that's much of a spoiler. We're just interpreting what hopefully you've read in the first book, right? Yeah. And, and you haven't even read the second two, so you're not going to be spoiling anything. 
and I think with Ed, with Lord Israel, he was really just concerned about accessing the power that came from splitting up demon and child, right? To make that to make the gateway into other worlds. Whereas Miss Coulter was really was, she was the one that was wanting to prevent dust from settling on kids, and the way to do that was by separating them from their demons. And so they they had parallel objective of both like separating children from their demons. But Lord Azrael wanted the power that came from it versus she wanted to prevent that change from happening. Hmm. I think I'm going to have to read more and think about this more to really understand some of the implications here. But I do love the layers that you get here. And if you have some takes on this, uh, hop on our Discord and let us know. Yeah, and these are definitely not the end-all be-all interpretations. This is just my personal, and I haven't even done that much like deep reading into this, so this interpretation could be wrong. But this is what I got from it as I was reading and thinking about it and watching the show. Yeah, I like it. And then at the very end, when they when they uh, join up and go into the alternate dimension and they kiss and kind of float up into the the nether sphere, whatever you want to call it, uh, that was kind of a, a, a fun and also shocking moment of uh, of clarity and also a little bit of disappointment because I was kind of hoping that Lord Israel was, was a good guy. I was hoping that he had uh, maybe he had Lyra's best interests at heart, but no, not at all. So, okay, where do you see or hope the series is going from here? Mm, so I don't know what's going on on the other side of this portal. They have talked about there being multiple dimensions. And I think there was a conversation that happened where Lyra had it explained that every decision that someone makes that springs off another uh, dimensional world. And there's a gazillion of these different possibilities existing. So I'm assuming she's off into another possibility, another um, probably alternate Earth of some kind. But I don't know where it's going from there. I assume Lord Israel will continue his quest to uh, to track down the dust. It's almost, you know, there's a little bit of a Pendragon feel here going into the different territories. You have this St. Dane character, if you've read Pendragon, um, one of Josh's and I's uh, favorite series. And there's some similar objectives here, some similar... Uh, kind of gray but sinister characters going on. So if it goes in the same direction as that series, I would uh, I would be supportive. Yeah, I think you're going to like it. I think you're going to like uh, how Lyra, her motivations kind of stay largely the same throughout all three books, but they take her to some really interesting places. Yeah, and I like Lyra quite a bit. I like seeing the world through her eyes and just how clever and obnoxious she is. I think I mentioned this before, but it's it's just a fun way to experience the story. For sure. The voice, Lyra's voice in this series is just is just really, really well done, I think. Yeah, I thought all the characters were built out really well. I listened to the audiobook and the audiobook is almost this thematic production where anytime there is dialogue, there's some background ambiance noise, and then you have voice actors, and then there is a narrator for the rest of it. And the narrator is actually Philip Pullman himself. So the audiobook is fantastic, at least the nice. version I listened to. Yeah, I listened to, to I think I listened to two different versions. One was just a just flat out re- normal audiobook recording and one was was the adaptation you're talking about and I really enjoyed that. I'm going to have to require this this adaptation, this thematic way of telling stories. This is required for all audiobooks from now on. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll try not to get too deep this one with I, I know there is a company that does this, but their audiobooks are much more expensive, but they've done it for some of Sanderson books. Haven't ever listened but i've heard some little snippets and it's it's just cool the ambiance always makes you uh gets you into the story a little bit more nice so uh, this will lead us into i guess the other adaptions too did you ever see the 2007 movie no didn't see the movie and i have not seen any of the hbo show so i watched the 2007 movie when it came out i think i watched it at like a friend's house so I, i think i was probably more concerned about like the girl i was sitting next to than i was about the movie you know yeah, yeah, one of those times. Uh huh. So I don't remember it very well, but I do know that they changed the ending. That I think they they shied away from actually Roger being killed off at the end, and so I think that's why a lot of people were pretty upset about it. Okay, and they did never make movies for the next two because there was a lot of backlash, right? Yeah, and I think the backlash came from like both. You get the like fundamental Christians that had the was upset that this was being like marketed towards youth, and then you got the fans of the book series that was upset that it didn't just take liberties. It changed like fundamental um, important parts of the story, which I'm all for adaptions taking what liberties they need to. But when you just take away like a major gut punch like that, that makes the story what the story is, 
then you, you're going to tick people off, rightfully so. Man, imagine a liberal and conservative group clashing over something that could otherwise be cool. Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? So that brings us to the HBO series, which you haven't you haven't seen any of the episodes. No, no, Planet. You told me to read the first two books at least before I start watching, right? Yeah, and I stand by that. So they bring in some of the character, one of the uh, characters from the second and third books, and interweave his plot with Lyra with uh, Lyra's story in the in the first book. So they not really interweave; they just jump back and forth between the the two characters. And so I think people should read the first and second before watching the show if they want the experience of knowing comparing what's going on on screen to what happened what happened in the books and you liked the shows i think they got pretty uh, pretty good reviews and they have a pretty good cast right yeah so so that's the type of liberty i'm talking about is okay to is okay to make you know with taking these plot elements from the second book and and putting them into the first season you know stuff like that can really add a lot and it helps you tell a better story or the story that you want to tell without you know just completely undermining things the cast was amazing lyra I'm forgetting the actress's name, but she was the same one from Logan and she did an amazing job. She was, in my opinion, the best part of the series. I personally think that she's going to be like what Daniel Radcliffe or just how he's just kind of Harry Potter or Elijah Wood, how he's just kind of Frodo. Like, I think she's going to do that with this character. Okay. So just another Millie Bobby Brown, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, forever. Yeah. Her, her acting was just outstanding. Now, some of the other casting, James McAvoy did an amazing job. I did not. I Okay, this is weird because I'm a big fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda. I think he does a great job. But I did not love him as Lee Scorsby in this. And I think that's been the biggest backlash. And I think that was the most disappointing because I was very excited for him to be in this role. But I don't know. I didn't think he did a great job. As soon as you, as soon as you hesitated, I knew it was going to be a Lin-Manuel criticism. Yeah. And Lee Scoresby is a Texan, right? He's from the country or alternate universe of Texas. And that's how he talks in the book. So Lin-Manuel does seem like an interesting choice, even though he's still a big personality. But in the movie, it was what's his name with the big mustaches, right? Uh, you mean Sam Elliott? Yeah, yeah. They wanted him to be Tom Marilyn. And that was like the dream casting for Wheel of Time on Prime. So yeah, those are two completely polar opposite actors, if you think about it. But so it's it's so weird because the casting was done so well for the 2007 adaption. Nicole Kidman as Miss Coulter. You got Lyra is Dakota Blue Richards. I'm not sure who she was, but I remember she did a good job. You got Daniel Craig as Lord Azrael, Sam Elliott, Evergreen in Mc- McKellen. Like you couldn't ask for a better cast. So it just really goes to show you how, you know, even a cast of amazing characters that did a good job acting it, I think, but just they, they went way too conservative on that. And then, they still had an amazing cast for this uh, HBO BBC adaption, but they spent more time getting things right on this one. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited to watch the show. I have the second book, the subtle knife checked out, ready to go from the library. So I'm going to power through that. It's a quick read. And then, uh, yeah, then I'll start watching the show and we can review the show as well. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a, just a series review when you finish the whole series and we can, we can talk about it as a whole, but if you, if you are thinking about reading this and have listened to this and, and gone through all the spoilers, even with knowing all the spoilers of this book's book, this first book, I would for sure recommend picking up and reading it because it's a great book and it's pretty foundational when it comes to YA reading. And I think you'll enjoy it if you read it. Yeah, we've had some some fans on Discord that say they don't mind the spoilers and just listen to everything. So I guess I didn't realize we were quite that interesting. But uh, if, if you're one of these people, yeah, go ahead and, and read the series. It, I'm certainly interested in, in reading more. Yeah. So let's, before we sign off, let's do the worst of the best. Stephen, why don't you go for, first with yours? Okay. So I thought the twists with Lyra's parents were, re- were really well done. You first realized that Mrs. Coulter was her mother. And then at the very end, Lord Israel was actually her father, not her uncle. But, but my issue here was just the way that it was done. It was an info dump for Mrs. Coulter, at least. That, that she was her mother. Lord Azrael being displayed as her father was awesome. It was right in the middle of the action. But learning that Mrs. Coulter was her mother was so anticlimactic because the Egyptians were just telling her her backstory and describing what happened when she was a kid. And it seemed like that could have been more exciting or, or led in in a different way. I thought there were actually a couple times where there were some longer info dump passages 
that turned me off a little bit from the action. And that was, that's my main criticism for this book. Totally agree with that. And again, in the, in the show, it was just kind of an info dump too. So I, I think that's a valid criticism. But I imagine in the show, at least they probably had the backstory acted out. So it was a little exciting with Florida Israel and Mrs. Coulter, like the duel that was happening between um, the other politician guy that he ended up killing, right? So it was probably an exciting moment, at least, or an interesting way to tell it. You'll see. I don't want to spoil the, the show for you, but... Okay. Well, hopefully it's not just an old Egyptian person talking and telling her what happened. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm worried now. <laughs> so so my worst of the best was um, the duel between Yolf, Yolfer... I'm probably saying that wrong. And York, York. Yeah, yeah. Our our bears, our our big armored bears. We haven't talked about them yet. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, which is kind of why I'm throwing it in here because we we've kind of neglected that plot point up until now. Okay, so you have this kind of return of the king with York coming back and kind of re- taking over his kingdom, or taking back his kingdom from when it was stolen from him from Yofer and Yofer and he was tricked into into abandoning it and. I really liked all that. But then with Lyra just convincing Yulfer that she was the demon of Yorick, like I just thought that, okay, here you have all this really cool political machinations of this bear tribe, which is just so, could be so interesting. And instead of getting into all those machinations and, and politics, Lyra is just like, oh yeah, I'm his demon, but I want to be your demon. So you should fight him. And I didn't love that. Yeah. The bears are way dumb, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's the other thing is they were built up as being you couldn't trick them, you know, and they would see everything coming, and then she just tricks them. Yeah, another moment where I thought Lyra was a little too smart, and also building off that, I thought the duel was cool, but also a little bit worst of the best as well, because when Yorick actually wins, there was no real reason for him winning. He just kind of outwilled him, and I don't like it when that's the reason why someone outsmart someone i feel like maybe there could have been something that was built up that was then unveiled at the last uh, you know at the best possible moment and those are fun wins you know i, I think you see that a lot in in the way S- sanderson writes he'll allude to something and then bring it out at the at the very climactic moment and you're like oh my gosh i can't believe they they did that because they were talking about doing it the whole time and they did it and it's awesome but you didn't really see it here yeah this one was more just well we need we need york to win so they fight and he wins yeah, he just kind of tricks him by pretending to be more wounded than he actually was. Yeah, but I mean, whatever. It, it didn't. It doesn't take me out of it. But it, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't how modern fantasy tends to do things. You're right. Yeah, and we're being nitpicky. I think overall, we're strongly recommending this series, especially for a YA. I don't always like YA, but for what it was, call it whatever genre you want. I like the book. Yeah, go read the book. It's great. It's a quick read, not very long, and. I think it's an easy recommendation. Awesome. Okay. That wraps up our review of the first book of His Dark Materials. Thanks, Josh. And I'm going to continue reading through these. Hopefully we can do another series review. And until next time, this has been Phantology Podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for letting me interview you, Stephen. It was, it was a good time, and I'm glad you're enjoying these books. You got it. See ya.